Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Ganaway, and I'm the director of marketing for the Reeling Group at Bendix. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about the impacts of, redu of the reduced stopping distance uh, legislation and what it means to you as you look at servicing and keeping your, qu your vehicles um, running. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, in April of 2011, there's a new mandate which shortened the stopping distance uh, of heavy trucks on the road, of tractors. The old rule had been 355 feet and the new rule of 250 feet. So essentially a 30% reduction. And you might ask, well, why did the government make this change? Well, the change was implemented uh, to make highway-related fatalities um, less and, and make vehicles safer. Um, FEMSA estimated that in making the change, uh, we would save about 227 lives on the U.S. highways annually and about 300 uh, serious injuries. In addition to that, we would save about $170 million in property damage. So the primary driver became how do you make vehicles safer? How do you make them stop shorter and much closer to passenger cars? And I'll show you a chart in a minute. First thing I want to talk about, though, is what changed. So as you operate your equipment, you probably haven't noticed a lot that's changed prior to 2011 and now. And that was exactly our intent, to make this as seamless and as trouble-free as we possibly could. But the brakes changed quite a bit. The first thing that changed is that we powered up, if you will, the chamber to put more force into the steer axle brake, since those tended to be a little bit undersized. If you remember back, they were about 15 inches in diameter and four inches wide. So now they're typically 16 and a half inches um, by five. The other thing that we did is we made the chambers larger. Typically, we would use a type 20 chamber, now type 24. So effectively, putting more force uh, into the brake, making the brakes larger. If you think about the brake's job, is to convert kinetic energy, the speed, into heat. And the faster it does that, the better it is. Um, think about yourself going up and down the stairs. Uh, by the time you do that the third time, you're probably not moving as fast as you did the first time. Our brake is the same way. Is it generates heat and counters fade. It doesn't work as, as well. We increase the braking surface to, uh, to dissipate that heat and reduce fade. We also added uh, bronze camshaft bushings and added precision cams. Those of you who've driven equipment in the past, you know, you lay on the brakes a little bit, you might get a little side-to-side -side pull. Well, if you imagine if you're putting that much more power now into the front brake, that would be elevated. So we tightened up the tolerances through the bushing as well as the, uh, the camshaft. Bronze bushings, you might ask, well, why did, we did th why did we do that? Well, the reason being that traditionally, many of our competitors use plastic bushing. And as that wears over time, it tends to wallow out and not be as efficient uh, as it was. So we may had to make the change uh, to bronze bushing. But probably the most important change that we made is changing the friction. You think about lining materials, going back to the mid-1980s, uh, uh, when we made the change from asbestos materials to non-asbestos, that was probably the most significant change. The stopping distance rules hadn't changed all that much, so it was relatively easy uh, to meet the requirement. Now all of a sudden we have to stop 30% shorter. We had to make these changes to, uh, to accommodate that. So back to the change in the friction. So for many, many years, those of you who are familiar with heavy trucks and drum brakes know about brake fade. You ever drive through West Virginia, Virginia, you see the runoff ramps, and those are there because as the brakes get hot and do a lot of work, they don't stop as well and they have to run out. Well, we also look at that in the lab, and what we do, we take a look at the brake, we spin the dyno up to about 40 miles an hour, and then we immediately slow um, the dyno down to 20 miles an hour. And we do that over and over and over again. Very similar to what you would do if you were coming down a hill. And we call that not a full stop, but a snub. And over a series of doing that, we plot that on the graph. So on the left side, we have the temperature of the lining. And you can see whether it's a disc brake or a drum brake. The more you do this, the hotter it gets, right? So back to our example of running up and down the stairs, this red line is what breaks look like. So, and this is pressure 
plotted on the right-hand side of the chart. So what we ask the dynamometer to do is we computer control it, and we want to get the same brake activity, right? The same force, same stopping power. But interestingly enough, as the brake gets hotter, it tends to need more pressure to do the same amount of work. Those of you who are familiar with air disc brakes, their claim to fame had always been that they were resistant to fade. In other words, the hotter they got, they didn't require any more pressure. They were just flat as a board. And that would be this line, the green ADB line. So in other words, going through that same cycle, as the drum brake got hotter and hotter and hotter, you'll notice a couple of things. It requires more pressure to do the same amount of work than the ADB does. And that was really how life had been in drum brakes for a long, long time. But a funny thing happened uh, as, we re as we released these higher performing brakes. This is the actual drum brake plot now with the newer technology lining. Same activity, same amount of work, same 40 to 20 mile per hour snub, but you can see that the pressure doesn't go up. It behaves very, very much like an air disc brake. So if you play that backward and use a non-traditional sort of legacy material, you would continue to see that, that same amount of brake fade. So how do the brakes perform? So I mentioned a little bit earlier that the old requirement was at 355 feet. The new requirement is here at 250 feet. Now, to meet the requirement, we typically had enough braking power on the drive axle. If you've ever done work on equipment, you know that the drive axle had much bigger brakes than the steer axle. They were bigger, they were wider, they were able to do much more work. Steer axle brakes, though, needed to change. They needed to get bigger and look a lot like the drive axle brakes. So here you have the typical passenger car stopping around 140 feet. So you go back to what the government was trying to do. You have this big truck coming out at 355, passenger car at 150. I've seen you guys have all seen um, cars duck in front of the truck with no idea that it takes the truck a lot more effort to stop. So anyway, um, these blue lines represent what the RSD friction is able to do. Now, we're able to stop well within that 250-foot requirement. This is the requirement at OE, off the line. Typical material will stop at about 215 feet. So the challenge for us as engineers and, and managers of the business was how do we develop this new material but make it affordable? Because it's very easy to do things when price really isn't an object. So what we were able to do after we met the initial requirement, we then put our effort into developing an aftermarket material that made it affordable for fleets owner and uh, owner operators to service their equipment. And you can see it comes in a little bit longer than the original equipment, but still would allow the vehicle to maintain the 250 foot um, stopping requirement. Common misconception uh, in friction is that all I need to do is use a more aggressive friction and that'll take care of everything. That's not the case. So what we did is we looked at a couple of different options. One was your over-the-counter 20K aftermarket material. And just by changing the two steer axle brakes, we added 96 feet to the stop. Very dramatic, OK? Then the next question became, well, but that's easy because it's not an OE material. I said, OK, fine. Let's look at it uh, at a legacy 20K material as an OE, still 290 feet, well beyond the 250 foot requirement. And then the argument became, well, that's okay, we'll just go to a 23K material, we'll, or use a more aggressive material and that'll fix it. Still doesn't do it, we come in at about 255. So if you go back to the chart uh, that I showed you before, that's because each of these materials still exhibit that traditional fade that we've been trying to get away from. So the so what in the exercise uh, and what I'm really trying to communicate is it matters significantly what um, service parts you use going forward. Probably didn't matter as much before, but the technology has changed. You look at this brake shoe, very, very similar, very common to what you've had on equipment since I started my career 20 years ago. Doesn't look a whole lot different, but lo and behold, the performance is a lot different. What you also notice uh, as you look on the wheel ends, especially if it's a Bendix brake, is we've now added this warning label so make it easier for who's ever servicing the equipment to know that there's something about the shoe and you really need to take due care 
to make sure that you use the right parts. Oops. So to wrap up, overall the industry has done a very good job of meeting this challenge of 30% uh, reduction. Took us about six years of R&D effort, a lot of testing, a lot of development, but it's been done. The solutions themselves are effective, they're affordable. Um, the example of the aftermarket material doesn't cost all that much different from the one that stops in 311 feet. And so what we try to do, the people uh, in the Bendix booth, is help you make informed uh, decisions. Um, the other point is most drivers probably won't notice the change, and, and that was our goal. Some of the brake engineers are here in the booth with us, and I'd encourage you to talk to them, because what we were striving for is for the driver to really understand the braking power in an emergency situation, but not necessarily be burdened with a lot of brake noise or dust or chatter and a lot of those things in everyday driving because as studies show, the vast majority of the time you're not making panic stops. You don't need to stop in 250 feet. And if you have a driver that does that all the time, you've got another problem, okay? Um, and then as I said, the selection of service parts is a lot more critical than it's ever been before. Parts look the same, they look common. That's absolutely the case whether we're talking about brake parts or compressor parts, um, speed sensors, electronics, so forth and so on. They really do have a bearing on the performance. And then, last but not least, understand that we're here to help. Um, the Bendix people that you see in the booth, whether they're wearing a blue shirt or jacket like I am, really want to help you make an informed decision. You go back um, to the rationale behind the mandate and saving lives and serious injuries, all those things will be undone if we don't maintain the brakes properly. So if you have questions, any at all, call us at Bendix, ask one of the people in the, uh, in the booth. We're more than happy to help you. That's what we get paid to do. And with that, I'll entertain any questions if, uh, if anybody has them. Go on once. Good question to the man in the suspenders. We, uh, we went with bronze bushings because we're very concerned that the old plastic bushings that we uh, had traditionally seen with the increased braking power just would not allow the brake to maintain its tolerance over the life. And, and what we've seen in our studies is as that camshaft bushing begins to wallow out, a lot of things happen. Noise as an example, stopping distance goes up, so now you've got a much more powerful brake. You really want to keep it nice and tight. And so to make the added investment of going from a plastic bushing or Delrin, if you will, to bronze was, was well worth the effort in, in our view. Anything else? Sure. Great question. The question was, what is Bendix doing to educate the new technicians? Well, one of the things that you want to do is um, tap into our website, brickschool.com. Uh, the other thing that we do fairly regularly is at our dealerships. Uh, we do a lot of training. We work with the dealer to do that. Um, if you go to our website, there are a number of videos to kind of walk you through those important things. And, and I'll be honest with you, it's a great question and really underestimated because a lot of the calls that we get are typically – from well-intended people who are performing service have been doing it the same way for years and years, but just not quite sure why it isn't working the way that it used to. So, great question. Anything else? Going once, going twice. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Enjoy your T-shirts, and uh, I'll be around the booth uh, as well as my colleagues if you have any questions.